right. Episode 89. 89. We're, we're approaching that 100 episode. Still say, I'll tell people that even though it's 89, there's still over 100 hours of amazing learning to be had. Um, I feel like I learn every week, and I hope that if you listen, you learn every week too, because uh, this work is important. And this work is simply, um, it's messy, and it's okay to be messy, and it's okay to have hard conversations, okay to talk about hard things, right? It's what we do every week. And um, part of, remember, if you all remember that part of the Trauma Informed Educators Network is we have a gathering every year. Um, we have a gathering called the Trauma Informed Educators Network Conference. And you all, it's coming up. Like it is coming up next week. Uh, and we have, 25 remarkable sessions from people all over the world who are going to be sharing their own knowledge and expertise around this work. And there we will be grappling with some card conversation things as well. It's part of this work. We also have Dr. Ricky Gibbs, uh, my partner in crime, my colleague, my friend, uh, the principal from Warner Elementary, previous principal from Warner Elementary. Now he is head of elementary schools uh, with lead uh, the lead school network here in Nashville. He's going to be kicking us off with the keynote. And then we have uh, Dr. Lori Desitel. She's been on this podcast uh, twice. An amazing author, thinker, and educator who's going to be talking about her educational neuroscience and why we have to continue to push the paradigm of what is traditionally known as behavior management. That B word just gives me that makes me cringe. Then we've got Robin Kogan, who is the relentless school nurse. Um, we're going to do something interesting, and you're going to be the first people to actually hear it besides uh, when we announce it to the conference. We're going to do a live keynote podcast. So Robin and I are going to just do what we do here, but you get to be a part. You get to ask questions. You get to be the interviewer. Um, and Robin brings a lot of deep knowledge of trauma-informed work in schools. And because um, I appreciate all of you that listen every week, remember that you can register uh, for the podcast at www.tienetwork.org backslash TIE Network Conference. Uh, and if you put in TIEN podcast, you actually get 20% off. It's only like a hundred and something bucks. Uh, we're not definitely not making no money and not getting rich off of this. It's more just about us getting a bunch of fellow disruptors together and uniting and saying we're going to do something different um, because it's what our kids deserve. So if you have not registered, you have until Sunday night. And then um, I have to turn that registration off so I can get everybody into their home groups. If you don't know what that is, we actually get into collaborative groups after the beginning and end of every day so we can actually build connections. We process what we've learned. It's pretty awesome. Um, and I got to make sure all the loose ends are tied up. So if you haven't registered, please do so. We would love to see you there. Right now, there's about 100 and I think about 130 people that are going to be there. So come show up and uh, be a part of the movement. But Nonetheless, if you've listened to the podcast, you all, I know that you've heard me mention um, about tonight's guest. One, about how excited I am for tonight's guest, but also how enraged I was during um, a time here in my county where um, I was not only embarrassed, but I was infuriated uh, for a variety of reasons. And tonight's guest is not part of my infuriation by any means, but she was on the receiving end of it. So uh, Zeta was born in Canada. She moved to the U.S. in 1994 to pursue her Ph.D. in American Studies at NYU. She's the author of over 30 books for young readers, including the, including the award-winning picture books Bird and Milena's Jubilee. Dragons in a Bag, a middle-grade fantasy novel, was named an American Library Association's notable children's book and was selected for the 2021 Global Read Aloud. Her poetry has been published in several anthologies, including Show Us Your Papers, We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Your Voice, and New Daughters of Africa. Her young adult poultry collection, Say Her Name, was named the 2020 Best of the Best title by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and was nominated as an Excellence in uh, Nonfiction Award uh, as well. But we're going to be talking about those books, but more about 
her book, A Place Inside Me. It was actually named as the ALA Notable Book and Notable Poetry Book for the National Council, Council of Teachers of English. So welcome to the podcast. I know uh, you probably got that insane Instagram request, like, we've got to talk. <laughs> but welcome, Zed. I'm so glad you're here. Tell us a little bit more about you. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thanks, Matthew. I appreciate the invitation and your enthusiasm. You did send several requests over several platforms <laughs> at once. So I knew you were serious. Fired up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's been uh, something consistent, I have found, actually, in the two counties where a place inside of me has been challenged, is that folks are riled up. Uh, on both sides. And that's encouraging because at least that means there's a conversation and a debate that's happening. Folks just aren't steamrolling the entire community. So like you said, I'm an immigrant. I'm Canadian. I've lived in the States now for 30 years. And uh, yeah, I used to be a professor. I was a professor for 10 years, but I was still working with kids. I've worked with kids since I was 16 and I am 50 now. I turned 51 in October. We were just talking about birthdays and I tell you, it's getting better and better. <laughs> it definitely gets better because you stop caring <laughs> as much as you used to about hurting other people's feelings or, you know, what will my family say or, you know, anything like that. I do think about the ancestors. I wrote a poem for, I delivered the Sutherland lecture last month here in Chicago. Um, and I wrote a poem um, and I said, I am the ancestors instrument. And I do like to think of myself that way. Uh, not all of my ancestors would be thrilled <laughs> to see me, a black woman up here speaking my mind. Uh, but I do come from a long line of women <laughs> who were called troublemakers. <laughs> and who would not swallow their tongues. And I consider myself um, in debt to them. You know, they made it possible. I have a whole wall, not too far from where I'm sitting right now, full of ancestor photos. And I'm very aware of the fact that, you know, people paid a price for me to be able to speak freely and to write freely. Um, I would say my goal as an author is sovereignty. <laughs> and so I'm really keen on being able to say what I want, how I want, when I want. Uh, operating within the traditional publishing industry is challenging. A place inside of me, it took 20 years to get that published. Um, and we haven't had much, any challenges really until the first one in Hanover County, Virginia, and then in Sumner County. So uh, those two experiences were certainly eye-opening. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whenever someone challenges one of my books, I've had two other books of mine banned, uh, it lets me know I'm doing something right. You know, mm, mm, I'm here yes, to I'm here to disrupt. I'm here to cause the right kind of trouble. So I, I must be doing something right. So I'll get this off the air, but I need to get your I need to get your address because I didn't I didn't have it on today. But I have unapologetic disruptor T-shirts and you oh, you've got to have one. And I, 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 I love mean. wearing it. <laughs> I wear it in the airport. Usually when I do a keynote, I wear it. And when I'm I just usually leave it when I'm walking through the airport, it gets more looks. And it does get, what does that mean? And it gives me an opportunity to say, I utilize my voice sure. to stand up for what's right. Even if it isn't about me, I get to have that conversation about unapologetic, unapologetic disruptor. So yes, you, you, you've got to get one of those. So a little bit of context right. on how and why I messaged you over, over Instagram. So I, um, my son attends a Sumner County school. He's in middle school. Um, and I was watching this book banning debate happen, um, on a lot of school uh, on the school board meetings. And I kept watching and watching and your book came up. Of course, the first thing I did was go and check it out and look at it and be like, I just don't understand. I don't understand why this amazing book of hope, this amazing book of resilience, this amazing book of a child's thought process of hope could be attacked by somebody saying it's indoctrinating, it's this, it's that. Matter of fact, there were accusations being thrown around in board meetings that were not even true. It was, this is in the book. And the board member de never actually even looked at the book because this movement of book banning is becoming a it's becoming a uh, people are jumping on bandwagons and they don't even know why they're doing it. They're doing it because everybody else is doing it. So tell me about your perspective, because I'm, I'm not joking you. 
I used to watch Sumner County board meetings as entertainment because it looked like it was like something off Saturday Night Live. Then I began to watch Sumner County board meetings because I was furious. I was furious that my child and children all over our county were being denied access to read books that they will benefit from, that they will get perspective from. I was angered. What was your, when you started getting texts and clips of these board meetings, what was your perspective? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that I had, we had just resolved the situation in Hanover County. So the first challenge was in Virginia and, you know, the community rallied against the book banner who said, you know, the book was misleading because her son thought it was about skateboards. Uh, <laughs> so if you're reading, you know, we have some literacy comprehension issues because it is called A Place Inside of Me, A Poem to Heal the Heart. Uh, so it is not about skateboards. <laughs> and, you know, the Hanover County, it went through all the steps. So it took several months. And, and finally, I think it was in August, maybe, uh, we got the resolution that the school board had decided to keep the book on the shelves, but just move it to the poetry section. And I thought, okay, fair compromise. Uh, and then I was in, I, would, I think I was in Scotland. I was in, in Glasgow at the end of August. I was there again in October. And I think on both trips, I started getting <laughs> more alerts about a challenge. And I thought it was still Hanover County. And I was like, oh, I don't have to pay attention to that. It's an old Google alert or something. And then I realized it was different because this parent was saying that the book, her, her child read the book and it made her her child think that Black people are inferior. And once again, I was just like, what are you reading? Like, can I hold up the spread that says, you know, strong, triumphant and beautiful, like, they're just clearly not reading the book. Um, and I, I just got a request from a reporter at the Washington Post to speak with her on Monday. Uh, and she wrote the article <laughs> that demonstrated that the majority of complaints about books in this country have come from 11 people. So it really is this tiny, tiny minority. But we do have a model, right? We have this, you know, I would say fascist group, Moms for Liberty, who has created a template that says, here's a list of books you can get banned. Here's how to do it. And, you know, banning books for dummies, basically. So uh, when I first heard about the situation in Sumner County, I, I just sort of felt like, here we go again. But because I had had a positive resolution in Hanover County, I thought, OK, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing I did last time, which is I will stay out of it unless I am invited into the conversation. I, I try to reach out to folks and say, let me know how I can support you. I realize I'm not trying to add fuel to the fire. I don't have to be in your county. I'm not just going to show up and give out books. Let me know how to support you. Uh, and it, just as in Hanover County, uh, Sumner County was just so impressive because concerned progressive parents started to form their own organizations, right? They mobilized Sumner for good. And you've got you know, these groups who are saying, we, we understand what's happening here. And it's, it's very true. It was, it's not just about a single book, right? Because then they came back with a longer list of books and then they came for the library. They want to close the library. Like, I can't even believe, I just keep thinking how are conservatives, they're just going to overreach. They're going to get to a point where even moderate conservatives are going to be like, library, why would you close the library? We all need the library. Um, so it was it was entertaining, as you said, at times. I think Tennessee Holler would send me <laughs> clips of the school board meeting. But it was also really inspiring because, you know, Julia, I'm going to blank on her last name, Garnett, I think you had some young people, you had students in the school system standing up to say, this is wrong. <laughs> I came through this school system and I know I have been taught that this is wrong. So what you're trying to do will harm me, will harm generations to come, my younger brothers and sisters. Uh, parents who had gone through that school system and had returned to their community and, you know, to say, I thought things had changed and now you're showing me that things haven't. Um, it just seemed like a wake up call for a lot of folks and, and they were not going to take it lying down. So that, that was really encouraging to me. Well, and I think to you and I, before we, we went on live, this isn't, this isn't new. This, these, these approaches, these tactics have happened before this these are playbooks that have happened across history. This isn't anything that's new. Fascism is something that has been around for a really long time. And watching it play out in our lifetime again, because this isn't the first time, right? Like, 
it, it, it not only infuriates me, but it tells us where we are. And yes, we have made some progress. I agree. But yet we have so much work to do. And I'm very proud of those parents uh, in Sumner County because I was getting a lot of those messages and I was getting a lot of those. We've got to do something. We've got to stand up some way. And, and I emailed the school board and I met with the school board and I was really um, uh, disappointed that a school board member that I had met with uh, and had lunch with and gave him a, 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 a copy of Dr. Bruce Perry's book and Oprah's book, What Happened to You, that talks about what is the impact of trauma and what is the impact of historical trauma and why do we need to make sure it's in the forefront? We had a great conversation. And then I see he was one of the only, I think, two or maybe three people that voted yes to ban. And it's this, it, it's just this idea that when we think we've come far, and I know that for the communities of color, they're like, we already know, like we're, we're not there, right? But I'm a white male. I understand where I am. And, and I have to continually keep myself in check in my own perception of what's happening because it's easy to lose sight of how much work has to be done. But let's get to this idea of during the school board meeting, oh, for me to even talk about this, it makes me just like, <laughs> oh, it makes me cringe. But a parent stood up and was talking about why are there books written about this? Why do we have to have topics like A Place Inside of Me, a poem to heal? The why do we have to have topics about that? And I'm thinking, wait, a topic about children experiencing things and trauma and community trauma and understanding how it impacts everyone and then seeing hope? Why? Because we have to, we have to have stories. And then she concluded with, why can't we just have books on chickens? Chickens and football. And because football. violent about football. <laughs> no, not at all. Exactly. Exactly. Chickens and football. When you heard and saw that, what were your, I mean, obviously I you thought something because you had a response. You LOL'd. No, not I literally. I just burst out laughing. Like, did she actually just say that? Yeah. And then I couldn't think of any books about chickens. I was like, like, what is she remembering? I'm like, Chicken Little. And I know she's not talking about Animal Farm, but. Right. <laughs> and then, yeah. And I'm like, if you want, so you want a book about chickens, I can do that. <laughs> I can definitely do that. You know, people, the publishing industry in particular has. Um, The tripling the number of books they publish with an animal as a main character. I, I, there we go. To the pressure to have uh, more people of color, children of color centered in children's books. Uh, and the idea is, the perception is that books with animal characters are race neutral, right? That they're somehow innocent. And that's what she was saying. Why can't we have innocent books <laughs> that aren't going to talk about these horrible things like injustice and racism and oppression and um, you know, I just thought I can use <laughs> animals to still talk about the same things I talk about in every book. Uh, yeah, so I wrote the story very quickly. It only took me a couple of hours, I think. Um, and I have done seven books, I think, at this point with Purple Wong. She's an illustrator based in Hong Kong. So I immediately reached out to her and just said, you know, are you available? And she got started a month later. So we, we got the book out in three months, which is pretty good. Um, mostly because she needed time. She works full time. So she needed time to, to get the illustrations together. But I just thought, you know, Chicken Wonders Why is an opportunity <laughs> to talk about storytelling and who gets to tell the stories, right? And Dick and Jane are the farmers who tell the stories to the animals every night. And they tell stories, the typical fairy tales of the knight in shining armor slaying the dragon and going to live in the castle. And so that's what Chicken dreams about. We see chickens dreams and chicken has never seen a castle or a knight or a dragon, but that's what she's dreaming about because that's what her imagination is being fed by Dick and Jay. So when they go on vacation, it's the animals have to decide, you know, who's qualified to tell a story at, at bedtime and goat who does not quite bear a resemblance to the mother who <laughs> opposed the book. Um, 
you know, goat says we can't you we can't tell the story because we're only animals and we can't tell the story unless we tell it the way farmer uh, Dick and Jane did. And we can't in, it's full of negativity. We can't we can't we can't because, you know, they've internalized all these messages that they've gotten from witnessing Dick and Jane, you know, controlling the narrative. And it's only when chicken starts to ask, but why? you know, very innocently. Well, why can't we tell our stories our own way? And then Pig uh, pig is the first to tell their story and the other animals build up the nerve and finally Chicken, by the end of the, end of the book, finds the nerve to tell that she's having new dreams because she's consuming different kinds of stories now. I mean, what, what a thoughtful, remarkable response because that wasn't my response when I was watching this. <laughs> my response was infuriated anger. And when I heard that you had written that book based off of that comment, like the admiration I already had for you because the books you write are remarkable and, and you, 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 you truth tell and you do it in a way that is just remarkable but that you just went to a whole different level of like someone who has this this incomprehensible ability to respond to something in a way that just pushes that bar even further to okay then we're going to have a conversation about who gets to tell my story who gets to tell our story and you're so right. This idea that the narrative isn't being controlled by the majority, by the 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 misinformation that has been put into our ec educational processes. I know it because I had no understanding of African-American history, of Black history at all until I went to an HBCU here in, in Tennessee, Tennessee State University. And I thought I was just me because I grew up in a predominantly white community. And then I found out, actually, it's the majority of the students who were black and African or African-American, they were like, we didn't know this either. So it was a it was a point in my life where everything that I had been told up to that point, I had to go back and go, whoa. I mean, I was taught things that were not accurate. And yet that narrative is still trying to be controlled that this is the story that must be told. And we know now, many of us, that that story isn't true. And it's okay to begin truth telling. And it's okay for our kids to know the truth. Because if kids are old enough to experience racism, my child as a white young man can experience and have conversations about what racism is. And we have to get to this point that in order to change, we have to have these dialogues and conversations. So when you wrote the book, when you wrote the book, A Place Inside of Me, the poem, To Heal the Heart, tell, you said it was 20 years in the making. Tell me where the book, how, where did it come from? What, what like, just how, how did it come about? Yeah, well, I was supposed to be writing my dissertation. <laughs> I, I attended NYU and then I finished my coursework and uh, I got a fellowship to Ohio University, Athens, Ohio. Um, and I had a, a semester to just write. And then I had a semester where I was going to teach a course based on my dissertation. And so my research was on representations of rape and lynching in African-American literature and culture. So I was already dealing with some pretty heavy material, but I have worked with kids since I was 16. So um, all while I was in graduate school, I was also teaching children. And, you know, part of my mission became, uh, how do I make the material that I'm grappling with accessible to young children, right? Because you would have to calibrate it in a particular way. You can't just walk in there with graphic material. You can't tell a story that's going to terrify or shame or, you know, uh, just alienate a child from their own history. Um, and then just before I was about to leave New York for Ohio, 9-11 happened. And so then the country is having this, you know, completely distorted conversation about terror, which begins on 9-11. And so many of us were trying to say, excuse me, 
this country has a very long history of terrorism and you've created this extremely narrow profile of who's a terrorist, but I could tell you some things about who terrorists are and what they look like and they don't have hoods on all the time. So I was supposed to be writing my dissertation, but I would, I would stay in my apartment and then I would go into the English department late at night when no one was there and I would print out the children's book stories that I was writing. Uh, and I sort of had a flurry where I think maybe I wrote six stories in five days or something just came really, really quickly. And one of those stories was Bird, uh, which became my, my first picture book. Uh, and I think A Place Inside of Me was also one of those stories that, and I mean, it's a poem. So it came out very quickly during that, that week, intense week. Um, and at the time, I imagined it sort of being illustrated like a calendar, like it would just have beautiful abstract art to go with each emotion. Um, I think I was also, you know, referencing the page that seems to get people so upset about uh, the boy feeling anger. Um, you know, I, I remember the Amadou Diallo case, like it's, it's not hard when you study lynching and you understand the ritual, the ritualized violence involved in lynching which includes, you know, hanging the body and then pumping it full of bullets and then taking souvenirs and, um, you know, to have police officers completely unloading their guns into unarmed Black people. It did start to seem like it was part of a ritual that it might involve some aspect of pleasure for them. Uh, it was just, it was a, and it seemed like a completely irrational response to a threat that didn't even exist. It's like, what are they imagining when they look at us for mm, goodness mm -hmm. sake? Um, so a place inside of me, a poem to heal the heart was really, you know, allowing a child to express all the emotions that come with um, understanding our history, right? That you would feel angry. It, that's a natural response to oppression and injustice. Of, like Juneteenth is coming up. Juneteenth is such a complicated holiday, right? Like it's because white people in Texas, the enslavers down there, refuse to follow the law and the Emancipation Proclamation and continue to exploit black people. And now they get a holiday. Like that's that's complicated. But you sort of we choose to focus on. Um, the African-American response to oppression, which is to say, we insist upon our humanity, we insist upon our community, we are going to um, practice forgiveness and compassion, uh, we are going to remain unified, we are not, you know, going to be consumed by bitterness, and uh, we're going to celebrate and encourage excellence. So there are, there are wonderful qualities, and I wanted to express those in the poem as well, but you know, I didn't want to have to shy away from the fact that sometimes this history makes me sad. Sometimes it makes me extremely angry. Um, but, you know, if I want to heal, and that is the point of the poem, a poem to heal the heart, then I have to turn to my community and I have to reach for the resources that we have always had, uh, our resilience and our compassion and our tenderness towards one another, uh, it was my editor, Grace Kendall, who read the poem and said, you know, how, how do you feel about turning this into a narrative of a, a, a protest rally, a family attending a protest rally? Uh, and then she brought on board the illustrator, Noah Denman, who won the Caldecott honor for her debut. And Noah had a completely different idea. And so we went with Noah's idea to have a little girl, very young little girl, um, sort of engaging with animals. So each emotion had an animal. And I was worried about that because I thought, oh, I can hear teachers saying, what's your spirit animal? So we're definitely not doing that. Um, and I came back to the idea of the protest and said, you know, I think this is a picture book for older readers, just like Bird was. And, you know, here's, here's what I would like to see. And I was living in Philadelphia and Noah was living in Philadelphia. So we were able to sort of make it a very site-specific uh, narrative with an older boy who's moving through his city, engaging with his community. Um, and yeah, the emphasis, the ending is about love, right? I love myself most of all. So I see it as uplifting and encouraging. Uh, it is not communist. The school board member in Sumner who said there was a Cuban flag, it's a Puerto Rican flag. <laughs> I mean, and that's just, why we teach history. And that's why yes. we teach geography. Oh, yes. wow. 
they were just, but they're grasping at straws, right? They're just trying to come up with something to say, this book must be a problem. Um, and like I said, it hasn't, it hasn't, it's not like the Moms for Liberty top 10, those books that get challenged over and over and over and over again. I have friends who are independent publishers doing LGBTQ work, really radical work on gender, Reflection Press, and you know, they've almost been bankrupted because their mm -hmm. books have been banned. Uh, so I, I had the opposite experience. I was very privileged that people went out and bought my book uh, as soon as they heard it was being challenged and they had a chance to look at it. So our sales definitely, definitely went up. Well, and we, I have a, a guest that was on here before. I don't know if you know Zaretta Hammond, who wrote uh, Cultural Responsive Teaching in the Brain. Her book has now been banned in Texas, Florida, uh, multiple. And I told her, you send me a crate and I will drive them wherever you need me to. Because again, she's truth telling. She's talking about, um, she's talking about historical context and how it impacts kids today. Right. And you used a word earlier, um, oppression. And I don't know if you saw this, but um, of course, you I know, you know, the the what happened here in the legislature with our uh, fiercely unapologetic, disruptive um, lawmakers. Right. We have Justin Jones uh, and we have uh, we have uh, the, the Tennessee three. So. There was actually, they wrote a bill that had the word oppression in it. And in our own lawmaker, our own lawmakers refused to have a conversation because of that word. And if that doesn't tell you how impactful that this blinder, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about anything has occurred. And it's mind boggling to me that the, what I just heard you say, it, it, it almost, uh, it almost breaks my heart and it infuriates me at the same time. I can feel my I can feel my chest getting heavy because the thought you put into that book, the amount of thought you put into that book to make it connect to kids in a way that brought truth and healing. And for people to not see that, for people to not understand that there are there are brown and black kids in schools that are majority of white trying to figure out where they fit in and they shouldn't have to fit in. They should be able to brace themselves and their own experiences and their culture and not have to feel this idea. And you were just trying to connect that to the kids of like, it's okay to tell your story. It's okay to be you. It's okay to go, that was really bad stuff. And you know what? That bad stuff continues to happen. And I can use my voice to talk about it. And yet everybody wanted to pick out the weirdest things of this book to attack. Like never did they really technically talk about the message. It was like the pictures, the flag, the police. Like it was this, the, the oddest things and they never really wanted to discuss the message. No, because like you said, if, if you have a problem with the word oppression, what you really have a problem with is the word oppressor, right? Like True. you don't want to talk about racism because you don't want to talk about who the racists are. <laughs> mm. So it, it, to me, it's quite clear. Like they, they, they don't want to have a conversation about inequality because then they would have to acknowledge that the country has not lived up to its ideals, right? And that there are certain groups who benefit. <laughs> Here we go, Juneteenth. Why would certain groups try to hold on to power over other groups, right? People don't want to talk about slavery because then we'd have to talk about freedom. <laughs> what really is freedom and why would someone take away the freedom of another person? Uh, so, you know, they, they, to me, it's blatant. Like it's very clear that they don't want to have a conversation around real history because they feel implicated by it <laughs> mm -hmm. and they should. Mm -hmm. That's healthy. Yeah. She Shame can be healthy. So when yeah. they say they don't want their children to feel shamed in the classroom, uh, it's because they 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 themselves feel ashamed. They they want to feel um, they want to promote this notion of blamelessness and innocence, <laughs> which makes no sense to me if you know anything about American history. So we can you know call the patriots victims of British tyranny, but you're not going to talk about the tyrants in this country, like. Um, but, you know, there's a whole, a whole huge, huge portion of the population that thinks somebody who has committed crimes and put himself above the Constitution <laughs> should still True. run the country. Um, True. 
we've got a lot of delusion, <laughs> delusional folks who, who have who have embraced uh, a fiction that has been circulating for centuries. They've embraced that fiction. They they just won't let it go. They're clinging to it. That's what make mm-hmm. America great again means, right? They're mm-hmm. clinging to this fiction of the past that mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. never real. It just was never real. And yeah, people of color know that. We know that in our bodies, <laughs> that it has never been real. Right. Um, and so we're going to continue telling the truth. You know, well, let me tell you, I think it's, I think it's ironic that in, in Sumner County, we have parents talking about they don't want their kids to feel shame. And, and I, I, I've talked about this in the podcast. I'm going to just blatantly talk about it now. While in elementary school, my child was terrified to make a mistake because they had public shaming as their primary behavior management, right. where kids clip down if they made a mistake. And, oh, it gets better. Once they hit third grade, if you clip down, you can't clip up. So that means you make a mistake. You can't redeem. There's nothing to repair when you make a mistake. And yet that is the that was the primary management system of the school in which my son attended. And let me tell you, I will admit, I came in really hot. My wife was like, you came in really hot. And I did come in really hot because it's harmful. It's actually harmful to kids. It, 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 it It's hurtful. And when we had our, uh, the two boys uh, in our, fo- uh, we served as a foster family, immediately, they were not, they cannot use that. I, I, it's not okay, right? And I got a ton of pushback. I went on Twitter and I said, what would you do if your child's school used this process? And the school responded from their Twitter account. And so that to me meant we were in an open dialogue, but we, we own that. That's the interesting thing is shame is powerful, right? But it's also power to control. When you constantly are shaming, it is a source of control. And if we shame, 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 right? We are oppressing. That's what it is. But if my child feels shame because I feel shame, what happened in the historical uh, history of our country, I feel shame. I know I am part of a system that was built on the backs of other people. I understand that. And I have to reckon with that all of the time. But I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not afraid of what I what we need to do differently. And my child, he is he keeps when we have these conversations, he says, Dad, I just don't understand. Like, how could those things happen? They're but empathy. That's what, it, that's what it is. It's discomfort, which it's leads it. to curiosity and inquiry. That is what schools are meant to support and promote. And so the idea that a child would feel uncomfortable and say, can you explain this to me? I'd like to understand this. What is happening here? And then because an adult feels uncomfortable, they're going to shut inquiry down entirely. That just, that, that is not how education works. Uh, But if you're not trying to promote education and inquiry and honest conversation, and you know what, the answers will be open and messy and, you know, there are no pat simple answers, but you can at least have the conversation have the courage to have the conversation. They're just trying to close conversation entirely. And there's times I'm like, son, I don't know how to explain it. Like, yeah, I just don't have the answer. Like, it's and one of I the think most powerful things you can do as an educator is to say yeah. to your students, I don't know. How can we figure this out together? Right. I don't know. You know, and it's encouraging. I grew up in Illinois. You live in Chicago. Um, <laughs> there was just, it was just passed, right? The ban of banning of books. So <laughs> you yeah. can't ban, you're banning the banning of books. So it's like, no, 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 no. We're not going down this road of banning books, right? What was your thoughts when you saw that, uh, that legislation coming through Illinois and, and it passing? Uh, I'm not surprised. I, you know, I just became a citizen uh, a couple of years ago, so I am new to voting here in the United States, and I voted for the people who <laughs> put that law into place. So they're doing this. They're, as far as I'm concerned, that's my will. That's the will of people. Uh, you know, we're a blue oasis in a very red sea, a <laughs> red desert, rather. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hear every day on the news things happening in Indiana and in the places around us. Uh, that are extremely worrying. And so it's it's reassuring to know that we have from the very top of the state, the support of the governor, the attorney general saying, you know, we control the purse strings. And so if you think, if you even think about, you know, going against the first amendment rights of these students <laughs> to read, to have freedom, 
um, you know, you're going to lose your funding. I, I fully expect there will be some very conservative communities that will say we fund our own libraries and so we don't need your money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because when it comes right down to it, it's never about money. It's about power. And it that's is. what they want most. And so, you know, we'll, we'll probably continue to have that. But it sends a message. It's it's a signal. Right. It's same thing with our protection of reproductive rights. You know, you send a signal to everybody else that says, here's what we believe here. Here is what we will defend in our state. Uh, these are the values that we want our children to understand, and we will defend them within our communities. So that is definitely encouraging. You know, when you talk about the First Amendment rights of kids, you know, it's interesting. I have another podcast that I do um, with Paces Connection, which is whom I work. Um, it's called History, Culture, Trauma. And we look at how history plays a role, right, in all of the thing, all the topics we talk about. And one of them was about um, child abuse in America and how that child abuse is normalized in America and that the dehumanization of kids is normalized. And there were laws against the treatment of animals before there were laws against the treatment of children. And when you say First Amendment rights, I know for a fact that there are people that believe children shouldn't have any rights, right? They yeah. shouldn't be seen, heard. They there should you go. definitely... They should not. Um, they should be working in slaughterhouses because why not? <laughs> I mean, it, it really is to this point of children. And I grew up in the era of children seen, not heard. I, I mean, I know I heard that. But we also think like uh, children should this idea that they don't have a voice, that having an adult tell him to give another adult a hug is OK. And it's it's. It's all of these pieces where we're we're not seeing kids as human. We're seeing them as somebody's child. We're seeing them as a student of here. Yeah, we're not yeah. seeing them talk as parental rights before we ever talk about children's rights. It's so true, and and it's so infuriating that our kids. But I, I will tell you, I have to say, I'm also encouraged by our youth because our youth know inequity. They know injustice. And I stood at the Capitol, the Tennessee Capitol, with tens of thousands of other kids, not other kids. I'm not a kid, but tens of thousands of kids. And I was there to support them because they bring me hope. They see injustice. They see this. And they're like, uh-uh, we're not standing up for it. And it is, it is encouraging to me that our kids are now using their voice, whether it's through social media, whether it's through protesting, whatever it is through, they're seeing these as injustices. And in that, it gives me hope because um, that's where change is going to occur uh, because Absolutely. the stronghold is losing grip. And it's why all of these fights continue to become more prevalent is because the stronghold feels their nails are starting to slip out of the hold and they're doing everything they can to yeah. remain in power. It's the last gasp. That's why I, I also feel encouraged. I'm like, when they get True. this extreme, it's the last gasp. It's like, we were so desperate. We have to do whatever we can. I mean, you know, children led the civil rights movement in the 1950s yes. and 60s. Children have gone before fire hoses and dogs. Children are, they're not fearless, but they, it's their future. This is what they're fighting for. They're fighting for their planet. I mean, for goodness sake, we live in a country where children are most likely to die of gun violence. We have not done a good job protecting our kids. So it's, you know, it's really heartening. In in York, Pennsylvania, when they tried to ban Milo's Museum, it was student-centered, you know, activism that made sure that the board respected its own policies. The board had banned an entire resource list of books um, without any review. And it was the students who were able to get that overturned. So I'm absolutely encouraged by today's young people. And any parent who wants to ban a book, I just think, you know, have you heard of this thing called the internet? <laughs> like, right, <laughs> right. And their children probably have cell phones. Un I mean, Anything I know. Anything you think you're keeping out of their hands. Like, it's such a delusion. <laughs> kids, kids know how to access whatever they want to get. They're going to get it. So... And God bless the libraries, like the Brooklyn Public Library, who are like, we got all the banned books, and we'll give yes. you a free card, and you can check them out. So, yeah. And I was proud of Nashville did the same. They they are encouraging yeah. read the ban, right? And you are yes. so right. The delusion of adults thinking they have control of children is mind-boggling to me. Um, 
kids have access to whatever they want whenever they want it. I would rather have an honest and open conversation around stuff so my son and I can talk through it as opposed to him thinking he has to be secretively going and figuring out whatever it is that he wants. This is about true parenting. It's about showing up for your kids, having true authentic conversations and, and letting them lead it most of the time. Um, well, that's it's not about a little bit of yeah. humility, right? A little bit of humility goes a long way instead of this authoritarian, uh, you know, perspective to just say, you know, in this moment, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know what my perspective is. I don't know what the history is. We could inquire and figure this out together. Could you, mm -hmm. my child, help me? Because I'm still grappling and I'm not sure how I feel about it. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity for families to have conversations. And teachers do that work all the time. They do it all the time. And what just happened in, in Hanover County last night, they voted to exclude librarians from the review process. So you have people who are trained, who have the expertise to assess books as to whether or not they're age appropriate. And you've just cut them out of the process entirely. So now you have school boards members who are elected and have zero expertise. <laughs> Being a parent it doesn't mean you know everything about early childhood literacy. Uh, and now they just get to decide whatever they want about any book. Uh, but I mean, isn't that, that is ultimately what the plan is, is to eliminate the people who know and just get the decisions that we want because that's what we want. Well, I told you our 45 minutes would go by so fast and man, we could have talked for hours and I hope maybe one day we can have you back. And I, I personally, from a parent in Sumner County, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you write. I want to thank you for your diligence and your unapologetic disrupting of like, Hey, it is what it is. I'm writing what I'm writing and kids deserve to read it. So I truly appreciate everything that you're doing for our kids because it is about all of our kids. It makes all of our kids better. And I appreciate it. So if people want to follow your work or get your books, where can they find you and uh, your, your writings? Uh, the best place to go is my website, ZettaElliott.com. Uh, I'm not too active on social media, but at Zetta Elliott. Uh, is a way to keep up with what I'm doing. Thank you so much for sharing your platform with me and for, you know, standing up for our kids and our educators and our communities that that's how we're going to win. Absolutely. And for those of you listening, um, you know, if you've ever heard me speak, I always say at the very beginning, are you uncomfortable? Or are you unsafe? Because if you're uncomfortable, I want you to embrace every piece of that uncomfortability. And I want you to keep your body and your brain in check and think, why do I feel uncomfortable? Because when that was said, I feel uncomfortable, right? Uncomfortable is okay. Um, it is absolutely okay to be in that discomfort. And I hope that maybe if you did experience that, you did think about why that discomfort happened. But thank you so much. And if you want to follow the podcast, you can follow the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. Um, as a reminder, we do have a group. It is now 32,000 people strong from over 100 different countries. That is the Trauma Informed Educators Network group. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you can also go to www.tienetwork.org. Um, we now are supporting schools all around the country um, around this work. And it's messy, amazing work. It is about let's figure out how we can disrupt the archaic systems that we have in our school um, that continue to perpetuate trauma within our community. So if you want that support, go to the website. We will help you do that as well. And as always, oh man, I missed my cue. As always, not yet. Here we go. As always. <laughs>for the few of you, Jonathan, thanks for being here, man. You're like here every week. I really do appreciate it. For all those of you that I didn't see and couldn't see, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, next week, uh, I don't know if I'm here or not. I know that the conference is Thursday and Friday. If I was wise, I didn't book one on Thursday night. But knowing me, I probably did, and I'll be back Thursday. But nonetheless, uh, thank you all for always being here and listening. 
and appreciate it. And uh, we may be here next week. If not, we'll be at the conference. So see you all there.